Hello, Joe Rose, and today we're going to be talking about art gifts absolutely, connecting the fate of beauty and the absolute choice, the modern counter enlightenment, negating sublating Aristotle, and how art is a litmus test of a people's onto epistemology, their absolute. It's very strange. Hegel seems to suggest that notion and nature are combined, that nature seems to follow the logical structure of notion. Uh, Dr. Holgate makes examples of chemicals combusting. They seem to combust according to the logical structure. And then the ability to think about chemicals following a logical structure may make it possible for us to create or see things in nature that we otherwise could not see, which may change how we carry ourselves in nature, and thus notion and nature inform one another. Now, they're not reducible to one another. It's very strange. It's some sort of monistic dialectic. A monistic is the opposite of dualistic. It means single substance. So notion and nature seem to make up, be composed of the same substance, but that substance seems to be dialectical even. And this is very, very strange. And we've recently had net discussions on, say, Michael Levin, Wolfgang, Verveke's talking about it. Everyone, there's a lot of conversation about how um, there's reason to think that nature unfolds according to vertical causation, almost platonic forms that seem to emerge out of phenomena themselves. This is very, very strange. Uh, I'm not sure, though, if it's any stranger than the multiverse theory or string theory. I think we're just in an age of... We really don't even know what the word matter means anymore, which is pretty funny if you think about it. You know, it, we, what, is, what, is, what is matter? Uh, if it's, is it, what is atoms? What is strings? It's very, very strange. And I think Hegel is suggesting a um onto epistemology that's 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 quite something now it's not merely the dialectic and hegel is not merely an epistemology it is an ontological description but since your epistemology is trying to conform to actuality it has epistemological ramifications but then what's also strange is how you think changes how you relate to that ontology which changes how it unfolds ergo onto epistemology very strange michael ponier who's a thinker of the modern counter enlightenment he tells us that we cannot use our spectacles to scrutinize our spectacles, which is to say that we cannot measure what we are contained in by what we are contained in. And if the universe is onto epistemological as nature notion, then how do we inspect or assess its development and our role in it? And what I mean by this is how do we know or have a sense if we're unfolding with our onto epistemology nature notion well, quote unquote. Now, well is a difficult word because now you're getting into values, assessments, and so on and so forth. So maybe instead, although I, I think there's not, at the end of the day, there is better and worse relative, you can determine that relative to what a thing is. If soccer is about getting the most points, then someone is better at soccer who can get the ball in the net. Um, I think you can meaningfully discuss better relative to schema and structure. And so if the universe is nature notion, there is the possibility of meaningfully describing the unfolding of nature notion well. So, for example, ignoring or denying the um, monistic dialectic of nature notion itself would be poor because that doesn't describe the universe and that would be reductionism, so on and so forth. So I think we can describe those things, but if you're in nature notion, then it's very difficult to get a sense of how you're unfolding in it, right? It's very difficult to compare it because you're part of it. So what in the world could be a potential gauge or something that would suggest how a people is unfolding according to nature notion? I would like to suggest that art uh, is indeed a indication of how a people are unfolding according to nature and notion. A term that's important for this is in my conversation with Cadell Last on Absolute Knowledge, we talked about the difference between the truth and the absolute. For me, the truth is everything that is the case, following Wittgenstein, while the absolute is everything that is the case, plus us. And since we're part of the absolute, we are also changing everything that is the case in our participation and awareness of it, which changes us, which changes everything that's the case, so on and so forth. So the absolute is very much alive. Following Hegel, we are dealing with an absolute, not just a truth. Now, the truth is negated, sublated, and part of the absolute, but it is not equivalent. There are differences. Now, you need both, of course. So the structure of nature notion is more absolute than merely true, and that would mean that we are participating in it. So what we are saying is that art can provide a sense of the absolute. Um, it can gift us with a sense of how the absolute is forming, how we are unfolding according to it, and so on and so forth. Now, certainty is mostly impossible in this life, but that doesn't mean we can't get a, um, a Leslie Newbegin proper confidence or confidence, which would be to say that we can't have reason to think that something is the case. So art can't give us certainty about the unfolding 
of the um, of the ontoepistemology. I'll go back and forth in my language, ontoepistemology, nature notion, the other term A, B, different languages because of different emphasis at different times, but they're basically all the same thing. And certainly art can give us, can't give us certainty, but it can give us confidence. Also, the very existence of art is important. Hegel places an emphasis on religion, art, and philosophy as three unique, they seem to be unique for Hegel in capturing spirits somehow, and I would like to suggest, it's basically, I, in my opinion, how I would put it, is that religion, art, and philosophy hardly make any sense to exist unless notion and nature are tied together. One can imagine nature giving us religion, art, and philosophy if there's some profound role of notion in nature, but it's hard to imagine it otherwise. Now, this case has to be um, explained and brought out, but when you look at a painting, is it just paint? Is it just paint? Is it just the material composition? When you see um, Van Gogh, uh, is that just paint? It is and it isn't, right? It's quite strange. It's Starry Night, which suggests something which brings out emotion that starts to have this very real effect. It's not merely taste. It's there. It is occurring to you. Maybe other people don't meet the conditions needed to have that effect, but if you meet the conditions, it is there. And the paper conditionalism is also important for all this for those who are interested, as featured in Reconstructing A is A. But when you experience art, you don't just experience paint. You suddenly experience notion, thought, feeling, the subject, all in participation with that nature that you are experiencing. And it is changing you. And as you are being changed, what you see in the painting changes and it goes back and forth, back and forth. Something similar happens in religion. The deeper you go into religion, the more you change as a subject, which changes your experience of religion, so on and so forth. So it goes to philosophy. There is some sort of feedback loop going on between nature and notion. Hans Ruckmacher, brilliant mind, and Michelle has done a lovely series about him on Anchor. He really believed that the death of art followed from the death of meaning, and that followed from the death of metaphysics and religion. And he kind of, he argues it's impossible to do art without metaphysics, because at the very least, you every movement of paint suggests a value. If you use blue instead of red, if you paint X instead of Y, that means there's a value. There's a decision, there's a reason you did X instead of Y. And so painting, in a way, can be a kind of map of meaning, I guess, to use a Dr. Peterson phrase. It can be a kind of map suggesting something. What is it suggesting? Well, a given painting, perhaps not, but it, but if we were to do, say, taking on the sum of art somehow, then it would point to the state of the absolute in the culture. If so many people are collectively on their own, independent, choosing to paint X instead of Y, this says something about how the culture sees itself in relation to the absolute. And Hans Ruffmarker basically is going to argue that the formation of um, art in Western society was suggesting that the West didn't believe in the absolute, only the truth. And you see, in the absolute, since you as a subject and your participation in it changes what it is, if you believe that the universe is nothing but facts, just everything that is the case, then that is exactly how the universe will give itself to you. That's exactly how you will experience it, because you are in that, and thus, if you perceive it as such, there's nothing in that that can change and force you to perceive it otherwise. It's like a conspiracy. It's like an ideology. You can't escape it. Um, and so, what, so then what Rookmark, it's almost like Freud looking for slips of the tongue, right? What Rookmarker is pointing out is that arts are a kind of slip of the tongue that unveil the state of the absolute, even if the people don't believe the absolute. So for Rookmarker, art is a kind of litmus test of the ontoepistemology is extraordinarily important. And what you see in art for Rookmarker is basically a Hegelian, uh, you're looking at something that can only exist if Hegel is the case ergo and onto epistemology, nature notion, that is painting as if Hegel is not the case. Um, you're looking at something that only exists as if notion and nature are, inter if notion and nature are interlinked, you could even say metaphysical with the meta in parentheses, which is another term I've used. And what you see in art is work that denies that it is in fact met metaphysical when its very existence requires metaphysics. In this, you see a sort of contra a negative contradiction, a sort of self-effacement that begins eating itself. Another example of this in story, I think, follows from Andrew Luber and Alex's work that they are doing on writing story. They had a lovely conversation at the Meaning Code channel on Toward a Better Storytelling. And if you see in story the lack of what they call theme, ergo the metaphysical dimension, then story is probably collapsing. Um, and art would be a litmus test of all these things. Now, another way to look at 
Mr. Handrocker's markers work is to think of Samuel Barton's missing axioms. It is impossible to, true, to be a true nihilist because if you're lying on the couch and you think I shouldn't do anything today, then you are saying that it is valuable not to do anything today. You cannot escape it. And so we're always putting forth values. And if we're always putting forth values, um, then, then we cannot talk about art as being valueless. If we do, we're engaged in some sort of contradiction. Another thinker that I find quite interesting, uh, and I think he was brilliant, Mr. Owen Barfield, and he makes the point that there are no things in the world, only relations, only us in relation. He is his famous example at the beginning of saving the appearances that I use all the time now is the rainbow. When you have raindrops, light, you in a certain position, and when all three of those are in relations, you get a rainbow. Is the rainbow real? Is the rainbow there? Certainly not a hallucin hallucination, because if other people... Um, meet those conditions, and indeed I think Mr. Barfield is describing something like conditionalism, then you see the rainbow. Um, so right there you see relations giving rise to a phenomenon. Likewise, when you have art, um, there's a the, all, the art can only, a canvas can only turn into Starry Night with relations between the canvas, the paint, Van Gogh himself, and the work. And likewise, we, when we look at the painting, find ourselves experiencing it in terms of the, our relation to it. Not because our relation is making it appear like some sort of strange, like just seeing it makes it there, but because there's something about reality that it is indivisible from the relations of all the parts and the whole is indivisible from the parts and the parts indivisible from the whole in a feedback back and forth. So for Mr. Barfield, basically all of reality is relations. Um, therefore, if you treat things like things, you're actually engaged in a form of idolatry. There are no things. Uh, there is a bookcase that is a relation of a bunch of different parts, atoms, whatever you want to call them, all. and they give and they give themselves in the as a gift as a bookcase. Which if they didn't, you could un couldn't understand it. But if you treat the bookcase as just a bookcase, as a thing, now you have a kind of idolatry. And I spoke with Trey Tellersbaum about this. And so now we exist in a world of idolatry, and perhaps it is not by case that a idolatrous world is one in which um, we find ourselves uh, suffering a meaning crisis, um, idolatry, nihilism, you know, et cetera, and so forth. Um, Rookmacher stresses that art never copies nature. Uh, art is always metaphysical. It's not merely nature. And that very fact actually would suggest that nature is never just nature. It is always notion, that there is in fact a nature notion. That's what Hegel wants to put forth. Um, and art, in a, the, the very fact, funny enough, the, the very fact that art must be metaphysical in of itself might be a revelation that nature, when we use the word nature, it doesn't mean what we think it means. You know, like, I, like we've said with Mr. Ebert, where the word limit doesn't mean what we think it means. Likewise, nature may not mean what we think it means. It may mean um, something much more live, rhizomatic, there are different terms, right? And that would be nature notion, perhaps. Um, for Rookmacher, there's something about art that gets at re it gets at reality better than a non-artistic photograph. Not that photographs are bad. It's that there's something about the portrait of a person that gets at something that the photograph does, the normal photograph. I mean, I know there are artistic photographs, but the normal photograph never gets at. One could think of Walter Benjamin's aura here. And for Mr. Hans Rookmacher, the, the great portrait artist tries to capture the aura of the person in the image, not merely their features, right? So the great portrait artist is trying to make a metaphysical representation of a person. And when you have a world that doesn't have portraits anymore, it's not going to be um, a surprise when, it's th when that world stops believing in metaphysics because all of its imagery suggests that things are just, there's only um, replication, there's only reference, there, there's just the physical being referred to. If all art is, is a simulation, um, as something that, uh, that has a signifier of a signified. And so for Hans Rockmacher, this could be a problem. Now, Hans Rockmacher makes it clear that art teaches us that there is a reality above reality which by definition must be, using his language, irrational, for rationalism is the main principle of the box, or physical reality. This brings to mind Benjamin Fondaine, and as Fondaine uses the term irrational, but I prefer non-rational, because I believe that's closer to what he's getting at, um, I believe the same applies to Mr. Rookmark, or although I could be wrong, but I believe the category of, I think you need, you need rational, irrational, and non-rational. I think non-rational is a helpful additional term. And... Um, 
what what you what the thing is is art suggests a reality above reality, but in the same way that if you come to understand that rationality cannot be autonomous without a metaphysical system or say tradition or the thinking of um, Hegel, and I'm ultimately going to talk about without the modern counter enlightenment, you don't have a way to guide that realization that rationality cannot be its own grounding, that physicality cannot be all there is. And so you end up in absurdism, postmodernism, and nihilism, because you don't know how to direct that toward the realization of nature notion. If you realize that physics cannot, the physical world cannot ground itself, but you have no way to justify metaphysics or any way to approach nature and notion in a monistic dialectic, well, then you're going to go off into absurdism, postmodernism, and nihilism. And also, that's why I think you need the modern counter-enlightenment as showing the tradition of thought that goes all the way to Vico um, to justify being against autonomous rationality or autom autonomous nature or autonomous notion. Um, you know, there's the autonomous rationality is as dangerous as autonomous non-rationality, as hopefully the paper, the book, Absolute Choice suggests. Um, but, but when you have an entire tradition that's been forming for many, many years that suggests a direction that one should take the understanding that there is a reality above reality, um, a, um, rash, a way of thinking above rational, rationality, if you don't have a tradition to fit that in, a tradition gives authority. It gives us a unique level of reason to believe something. And so if there's this entire tradition, then it feels very legitimate to fit uh, the realization that there's a reality above reality into that and to move forward. So that's another reason why I think the modern counter enlightenment is important. Rookmacher tells us that perhaps one of the main problems of art today has been the result of giving art the wrong fun function. And indeed, Hegel would have us see it as a testament of notion participating in nature and, um, and notion and nature participating in notion. But you see, um, we think that art just has the function of being a signifier of the signified. We have not thought of it as having the function of being a litmus test for the health and well-being of nature and notion. And as a result, um, it has simply fed our reductionism, our absurdism, our nihilism. We have put it in the wrong direction. And as a result, we have um, engaged in auto-cannibalism because we found ourselves in autonomous nature and autonomous notion. Now, after making this case or this point at the very beginning of the paper, the argument is going to go in the direction of suggesting that by only having A is A logic or A is A thinking, which is discussed throughout O.G. Rose, we basically don't have the symbolic by which to understand what art is, or religion, or philosophy. Uh, the, the paper will talk about conditionalism, we'll make points about that. Um, it's going to talk a bit about Scruton, his wonderful book on beauty, where when you see a neat or a set table, it just strikes you as being, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. It meets the condition. It, you know, there's the in praise of shadows, the bridge over the dryna, all of these examples of various conditionalisms where when a certain condition is met, um, you could say it's a clearing that being comes forth to um, reference Heidegger. Um, the, the paper will talk about Hans Gadamer, who makes the argument that art presents the horizon of history, not merely the information of history. And so you really can't understand history unless you have art. And there's a lot more to Gadamer. I, I, Gadamer deserves, um, I, I think he's quite something, uh, truth and method. And I, I should write a paper on it. He's, he's quite, a, quite a mind, in my opinion. Um, but, uh, but Gadamer, he's going to be presenting all these things. The paper will also talk about the extraordinary Firebend, um, Paul Firebend and Against Method, who also wants to point out, um, well, I'll pause here because you, you have all of these examples of conditionalism, but basically if you only have an A is A symbolic, you really, you, you really don't have the symbolic by which to understand these phenomena or what they're doing or what these people are saying. Um, and likewise, you can't understand art as a testament, as a litmus test for the metaphysical because it's just a thing is a thing. A paint is paint. Religion is religion. It's a social gathering or something, right? Without A, B logic, you can't see nature and notion in relation to one another, so you just lack the symbolic. Um, you know, Wittgenstein has the line that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Well, we could say the limits of my symbolic are the limits of my world, or the limits of my symbolic are the limits of my understanding. And indeed, if the limits of my symbolic are the limits of my understanding, and notion informs nature as nature informs notion, then that very limited understanding would change how I experience notion, which would change how notion presents itself, almost like being, if we haven't cleared and we're stuck in Western thinker follow, thinking following Heidegger. And as a result, uh, the world will present itself to me as if it is indeed autonomously A is A, and thus that is what I'll have, quote unquote, reason and evidence to think is the case. Now, what's interesting is we can almost read against method as kind of the clearing of Heidegger, because if you read that, because as I, what's extraordinary about that book 
is um, Mr. Feyerbin basically wants to argue that the scientific method almost gets in the way of science, actually. That science arrives at new paradigm shifts, new thinking, new innovation, new technologies, precisely because you have renegades like Galileo, who, what, what, what Feyerbin points out is that Galileo wasn't just impo- opposed by the church, he was opposed by the scientific consensus of the day. And so once it is the method of which traps science like a straitjacket, um, Firebend is not against experimentation. People hear that it, it, there's kind of this difference between method and experimentation. Have all the experiments you like. Science is driven by experimentation, but the problem is if there's too much emphasis on method, then it's trapped by that very method. We must be willing to do experimentation that is beyond just a autonomous method, if you will. And so for Firebend, like when science just becomes the scientific method, it runs the risk of having a very um, narrow form of experimentation that it cannot go beyond, and thus what will be the science is only that which fits scientific method, and the world will be sliced into something that fits into that. You could say that if the scientific method only allows A is A conclusions, then science will only ever conclude A is A results, and then if science has authority in your culture, then the only thinking that is scientific and authoritative and quote-unquote intelligent to think will be A is A, and then you'll be sliced, shut off from the entire world of AB, capital B being, if you want to use that language, nature knows, you'll be shut off from all of that and precisely believe that you are educated and enlightened in that very enclosement. Makes me think of Kierkegaard's idea that the man is in despair, doesn't know he's in despair, where if you know you're in despair, you're coming out of despair. And I think, well, that's kind of what Firebend, um, Mr. Firebend is, is suggesting. And you see, to, I think to help get what he's saying with method being dangerous in this way is to take something at the beginning of Alfred Korobowski's extraordinary text, Science and Sanity, where he talks about Roman numerals. And the point he makes is that basically it is completely impossible to do modern mathematics without with Roman numerals. He says, um, to quote, could modern mathematics be built on the Roman notion for numbers? One, two, he's got the I's here, I, you know, I, V, V. No, it could not. The simplest and most childlike arithmetic was so difficult as to require an expert, and all progress was very effectively hampered by the symbolism adopted. So the point he's making is that the people's thinking was directly tied to their symbolic structure. A world that thinks and uses Roman, Roman numerals is capable of not even the most brilliant person is capable of a mathematic that is extraordinary that is at best simplistic following a different mathematical symbolic structure which i think right there suggests a relation between rationality and non-rationality as we talk about say in the trilogy the true isn't the rational so a way to look at that is that that the symbolic structure according to which you think and follow notion which then is kind of in nature right because you write it on paper it's in the world uh, impacts the kind of notion that can unfold, which changes what you can do in, the nat- in, in nature and how you interpret nature, and it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then fortunately, though, the world um, won't fit entirely into our notions, and so where there's a break, it's possible for nature to change our understanding of notion, that then changes our world, so on and so forth. But the point is that a people's symbolic um, entirely impacts um, how they unfold the world. Now, for Korbowski, and he praises Aristotle, he's not against Aristotle, the point he wants to make is that basically A is a logic, is an outdated symbolic, extremely similar to Hegel, in my opinion, and Cadell will speak on this very well, where there's this emphasis on needing a new logic. Log- the point of logic is the mediation of the instincts, and an outdated logic will prove inadequate for the mediation of instincts. And if you can't mediate your instincts, well, that can lead to all sorts of trouble, pathology, social issues, and so on and so forth. And so there's a need for that um, negation sublation of Aristotle into A-B thinking, precisely to avoid those unintended um, consequences. And the thing that's very interesting is that Korbowski will stress here how a system represents a complex whole of coordinated doctrines resulting in methodological rules and principles of procedure, which affect the orientation by which we act and live. And we cannot avoid assuming a system worldview or the like. So we have to have something. And if it's outdated, we're going to be trapped, our thinking will be trapped, and we won't even know it's trapped, really. And, but then, of course, it begs the question, what occurs to make you realize that Roman numerals is inadequate? What occurs to make you realize that A is A is inadequate? Well, it might just, uh, this might get into the how of Nineveh flies at, you know, dusk, it has to be a disaster, and then you go, oh, we must have done something wrong. Um, it, it may be when you find your mathematics is hurting your economy, your symbolic is hurting your economy, so you have to change your symbolic. It might have to be a disaster. 
But another way might just be the revelation. If you take seriously art, art might the very fact if you if the experience of art does not fit into A is A thinking or your pre-existing symbolic, this in of itself can suggest that um, that it is in, in you have to choose is the art inadequate? Is art just a freaking picture on a wall, or is your or is your way of understanding art incorrect? And I think in that very break, that very decision dare I say, absolute choice. You have to make a choice between nature and notion. You have to, you have to choose if nature and notion are relating to one another in the, in the way that we're describing with Holgate and, and, and Hegel and all that, or not. If it's just autonomously nature, autonomously just a picture. There were times where it was all thought, all spirit, autonomously non-rational, maybe in different people like that. Today, we tend to be on the side of saying that there's just the physical world. So we tend to say there's autonomous nature. We have to make the choice. The experience of art kind of forces the choice. Now, further, um, further, m much more can be said on A is A, the inadequacy of A is A thinking, why I think Korbowski is correct on the need to, embolic the, to um, negate, sublate the symbolic. Um, particularly in the doctrine of, B um, I think we see in the doctrine of essence, um, quite a bit where Hegel talks about A is A thinking. And he makes the point, for example, I think it is chapter two, and Hegel tells us that the essential category of identity is enunciated in the proposition, everything is identical with itself, A is A, or negatively, A cannot be at the same time, A and not A. For Owen Barfield, this would suggest that A is A is idolatry, and Hegel will indeed suggest A is A in incomplete and problematic, even if useful, for determinateness of being is essentially a transition into its opposite. So things are always becoming, right? So in what way can you use an equal sign? I mentioned we talked, Trey and I talked about this. You can't really mean, use the equal sign meaningfully if things are always becoming something else, right? Um, and that's where Mr. Ebert was um, describing how a lot of ma mathematicians today, there are mathematicians today making a debate that we need to get rid of the equal sign in favor of equivalence, where a thing is 99% like or like, but not totally like something else. And that's, that almost would suggest the metaphysics of adjacency of a layman Pascal. Um, also, in the doctrine of being, we learn that being is nothing and nothing is being and thus it is becoming. Well, if the equal sign is like A, the only way the symbolic of the equal sign makes sense is if it's saying A is being A, right? Well, there is no being, only becoming. And in what way can you say A is becoming A? That doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so, you know, well, A being A, like why do you even need to say that? The only thing that makes sense is to say that A is becoming A, but that doesn't make sense because if it's A becoming A, it's not becoming at all. It has to become B. So A is always becoming B. That's the only thing that seems to make sense. And so the, it would only seem that you could meaningfully say A equals B with the equal sign not being one of equal as being, but a um, symbol of equivalence ergo becoming. Um, so we have, an we have an inadequate right there. You see an inadequate symbolic, right? Where the, le the equal sign itself is a somewhat um, inadequate symbolic. It does not have it does not have the function, and it may be trapping our thinking. Arguably, the equal sign might be the most danger or the most problematic symbolic of all, because it suggests the possibility of stable being, and in of itself, maybe having as a, these these damaging effects of Roman numerals if we still use them today. Um, autonomously or singularly, uh, the equal sign might be the greatest problem. It is funny to think how different logic and mathematics might be if you did not have an equal sign, only an equivalent sign. That right there could change the world in quite profound ways. So indeed, the equal sign itself seems to be an outdated symbolic holding us back from our um, from modern thinking. And it could be suggested that the entire modern counter enlightenment is a tradition that gives authority to thinking in those terms. Um, so you have a tradition there to, um, to fit it in. And indeed, if, if we get rid of the equal sign, then it becomes easier to understand what it means to say that nature and notion are dialectically relating. It, it, it hurts the brain to think about because you're looking for an equal sign. Right, but that, but the notion itself makes the 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 idea of a monistic dialectic or nature and notion itself only makes sense outside the equal sign. So you have to let go of the equal sign. But how do you think without an equal sign? Well, you almost like in all practical purposes, the equal sign is a useful tool because it allows a is a, which allows 
um, understanding, but for Hegel, you have to, that's too one-sided, you have to move into reason. But if you knew that the equal sign was an inadequate symbolic and you didn't use it, you used something that just meant equivalence, that would perhaps habituate the brain or make it easier on the individual to think according to A-B thinking. Uh, because the symbolic, you wouldn't be falling back into um, a problematic symbolic. So yes, the, the very idea, the very ontoepistemology of nature notion is very, one of the reasons it's hard to grasp is one, because it's hard to grasp. And second, because there's, there's a subconscious searching for an equal sign, which in of itself is a symbolic, um, a symbolic, a problematic symbolic, which is holding us back. So that, and, and then of course, the moment where you're looking for representation of it in a thing, right? But that's idolatry following Owen Barfield and is fundamentally not a thing, but relations. But we don't experience relations in terms of understanding or picture thought or directly, if you will, but all indirectly. And the equal sign basically trains us to subconsciously associate directness with reality. Reality is an equal sign, one big equal sign, one big everything being of itself, but that equal sign doesn't exist. It, it does not, it is, it is a false symbolic. And so that um, basically the negation sublation of AA to AB is a leaving, is a negation of the sublation of the universe that we think in terms of an equal sign, directly or indirectly. And you know, there's that lovely channel, I think it's called What is Money, with a gentleman whose name escapes me, he talks a lot about Bitcoin, he has a, lo a lot of lovely interviews. It, it, he was just actually talking about the invention of zero and how that made possible modern economics, modern commerce, which completely transformed systems because economics is ultimately data sorting, data transfer, and how the world basically, almost the modern world would be impossible without the invention of new ways of representing data, thinking about data, which required the zero. And you could, there was just a limit to the size of numbers you could think without the zero. And so the transform it right there, the changing of the symbolic changes everything. So likewise, if we start going, there is no equal sign, there's no telling what that would unlock. I mean, uh, I mean, right now it's basically impossible to think without zero. There was a time where it felt impossible to think with it. Likewise, right now it feels impossible to think outside of A is A. But if you, you know, you had centuries or decades or whatever, training and habituating yourself thinking without the equal sign, ergo AB, well, then it would be, it would start to feel crazy to think according to AA. So it's important to realize that subconscious habituation that brings with it something emotional. And also the great line from Hegel comes up where the fear of error is the fear of truth. You know, if we're afraid to use zero, because what if it's nuts? If we're afraid to get rid of the equal sign or create a new symbol, because it's nuts, if we're afraid to use AB well, then, um, then that precisely will lead us to be stuck in what we are in. So we better hope that what we are in is the complete whole, the complete truth. But of course, that is very unlikely. Also, funny enough, error itself is a, is a word that almost requires the equal sign. But if, because you say, oh, if I say like A equals B, you're like, oh, that's a mistake. But when you start saying A is becoming B, oh, that's not a mistake. So the, 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 the entire idea of error as, a, as opposed to experiment or attempt or try or possibility in of itself seems to be kind of um, a part of thinking according to the equal sign. So this kind of, you're either right or wrong. You're either in truth or error. All of that kind of binary thinking and binary thinking in general seems to be products and children of the equal sign. And so if you can deconstruct or negate to like the equal sign, all of that can change. And then you start getting into how Derrida wanted to get rid of dichotomies, wanted to open up thought, Heidegger clearing and all of that. Perhaps the, um, perhaps, perhaps what is kept back being with a capital B is not so much lowercase b being as it is the equal sign. Maybe Heidegger was trying to uh, <laughs> try to clear the equal sign so that being could come forth. And I guess that makes sense because when you say a tree is just a tree and then you're like, oh, it's standing reserve, it's just lumber, then it can't be wine to use uh, as I've been talking about. It can't, it can't disclose itself as anything else. It just equals a tree, right? right? So it would make sense if we can think about Heidegger's clearing as a kind of clearing of the equal sign. Um, now, the next part of the paper is also going to be getting into the magnificent Cardinal Newman, the grammar of ascent, which I think is incredibly useful for understanding all this. And basically, Cardinal Newman is going to say that it's not possible to think 
except to a scent where there's a lack of knowing, where you don't know for sure. The, the great example he makes is the Shakespeare sonnet. In order to under, you, a child can hear Shakespeare, not understand it, and yet still assent to, the, to it being beautiful. And precisely because the child assents to it being beautiful, the child will do the work to understand the sonnet. So there has to be an assent before there's apprehension, per se. And he has, a, he has a certain language that he uses. But you have to assent to something so that you can work yourself to the place where you understand it. And maybe you understand that it was incomplete, but you really couldn't fully experience that it was incomplete unless you acted like it wasn't incomplete, right? Or that it, you know, maybe you find out one day that the Shakespeare sonnet doesn't make any sense at all. But in order to get to that place where you can understand that, you would have to assent to it being worth trying to understand. And, and right there, I think we see in Cardinal Newman the structure of um, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, right? Where you, you have to... But consciousness has to believe it is capable of grounding itself to reach the point where it realizes it must transition into self-consciousness, then into reason, so on and so forth. You know, reason, spirit, religion, absolute knowing, so on and so forth. So it has to operate as if it is autonomous in order to fully reach the place where it realizes it cannot be. And that makes me think of Kurt Gödel, uh, you know, where you have, to, you have to believe that math can be axiomatic to reach the place where it's undeniable that it cannot be, which then, of course, opens the door to the question of what exactly is math. And then you have a negation sublation there, right? But it's in the failure. Well, Cardinal Newman basically wants to show that all thinking requires that. And that then leads us also into like Isaiah Berlin and I guess uh, ver verificationism. The idea for, for a lot of people that something was meaningless until it was verified. And Berlin's like, hey, the, the phrase it's meaningful, it's raining outside is meaningful to you before you verify that it's raining outside. And in fact, it has to be for you to go and friggin' verify that it's raining outside. So meaning in this sense comes before verification. Well, likewise, um, we assent to something uh, before the thing can disclose itself as what it is. So you have to assent to reality being nature notion, uh, and that has to be meaningful to you, and, reality, and art has to be meaningful you, to you, so it can disclose itself as pointing to a world um, of relations that is not merely of things, but AB, where the equal sign is not the case, right? Um, and so you have to assent to that possibility to live in a manner where the world can unveil itself as such. But if you're using a Roman numeral symbolic, you would have no reason to, um, to think that way. The, the idea of AB, here's the issue. There's this problem, this weird problem here where um, your, what you believe is meaningful is kind of bound and contained and organized uh, by your symbolic, by what you've thought. And so if you're in a world with Roman numerals, uh, modern mathematics would be meaningless to you, right? Well, then you couldn't verify modern mathematics precisely because the symbolic would not allow modern mathematics to be meaningful. So then you would have something you could assent to before it is um, verified so that you can verify that meaning as being substantive. So the limits of the symbolic are very, very problematic. And of course, this begs a chicken or egg. What changes first? The symbolic? Does something happen in reality that shatters the symbolic? And so you're forced to have a new symbolic. What occurs? If we follow Hegel, it seems to be the dusk, the owl of Nineveh, it seems to be... It, and then you get into all the religions, right? Where it seems to be the cross or beauty, beatific vision or devastation seem, seem to wake people up. Flannery O'Connor, Grace the Bull, pulls you out of your dogmatic slumber, the lame will interfere, you know, all these different stories. She has, you know, someone had to shoot a gun on her every day at the end of A Good Man is Hard to Find. This great mystery of what comes first, but... Regardless, they're all feeding one another in of itself, of which suggests nature a notion. The very fact that there's some sort of enclosure mechanism in the nature of reality itself suggests that nature and notion are tied together. And I've been speaking to Michelle lately about how maybe ideology is kind of the negative opposite. It's like the opposite. Where ideology is where nature and notion are operating in this feedback loop that encloses you in it. But it's taking you away from the world that is actually there. Maybe in that sense, we could talk about <laughs> instead of uh, lowercase b being keeping you from capital B being uh, to talk about Heidegger in a very simplistic way, because that is a simplistic way, but it gets at Heidegger. Maybe the problem is ideology, uh, lowercase b being, quote unquote, keeping us from nature notion in Hegel's sense, capital B being per se. And so how do we get out of ideology? And, uh, you know, if technology is the new ideology of the world for Heidegger, then that would make sense. Um, so there's something about reality that has this enclosing function where you're stuck in it. That in of itself is evidence of nature notion being linked in the way that Hegel so describes. 
So what we see here is if we take all this quite seriously and you have a new symbolic with Hegel's logic would give you the very granting of us of that symbolic would be like the number zero changing economics making possible modern economics escaping Roman numerals making possible um, modern mathematics. Hegel is giving us a way to think the world. He believes that Aristotle's, um, it, you know, the, the, the symbolic doesn't work anymore. And there would be very good reason to think this is the case. Well, let's put it this way. The very fact that art, religion, and philosophy just don't seem to fit in any of our symbolics or schemas by understanding the world, it's almost like, as a result, they've, they haven't given up on us. They're really like, look, we're going to keep reaching for them. We're not going to give up, almost like God's grace, just continually reaching for man, even if we hate God, and therefore it's hell, actually. If, you know, that, that's actually the thing. Like, if you hate God, then his love for you, you it's, it's hell. But, he can't, but God is love, so he's always reaching for you. Um, he never gives up, which if you hate the fact you hate God, then the fact he never gives up becomes a torture in a funny way. But in a good way, then uh, religion, philosophy, and, um, and art are like perpetual sources of grace, of reality itself, reaching toward us with the revelation of ontoepistemology as the case of A.B., which in always reaching toward us per se, always make there be a hole in our enclosure of A is A thinking, which if we look at clearly and see clearly, we can poke at, if you will, and then the entire enclosure fall apart into AB, into ontoepistemology. It makes me think, like Derrida would kind of talk about how he would look in the notes or the back notes of books, and there you could find little notes to assumptions that if you poke on, the whole book falls apart, right? Like, like authors would hide in their books somehow the axioms or the assumptions they couldn't justify. And if you found that, then the whole work could collapse. Likewise, perhaps art, religion, and, and um, art, religion, and philosophy are these things that if you poke at, that if you find the entire A is A structure falls apart, and it, the, 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 the faulty symbolic falls apart and opens up the, the world on the other side. But art is a testament that the equal sign will not do. Art suggests that the equal sign is inadequate. It's not, it's not false, per se. It's just incomplete. And you see, there's another great book, which you could align with Newman, The Degrees of Knowledge by Jacquois um, Marion, is a great mind. And he makes many points, I think, that are similar to Newman. Uh, but he also has this great line where he says the mind does indeed have to choose its path from the start because the path you choose from the start determines where you go, and where you go... Well, that's all you see, right? And so if you choose A as A, then you structure yourself according to A as A, and that's all that discloses itself to you. So it's important to get this right, but it's very difficult to get this right if you have the wrong symbolic, because the very symbolic would, think, would keep you from thinking that you're not right. And so how do you escape that? This is very, um, very, very tricky. And this is where, for Marion, the mystical, the religious, and all of this come forth. And, you know, it's kind of funny because basically religion, philosophy, and art, if you look at it clearly, what they do, this brings up the non-journey I like to talk about with Hegel with the non in parentheses, where if you have to conceptually mediate what these things are, and then you arrive at where you've always been, you know, the place of our beginnings to know it for the first time in a T.S. Eliot little getting sort of sense, right? And boom, where you've always been is an A.B. world. You just haven't had the symbolic to see it. You haven't had the glasses to see it. Because ideas are practically eyes, and if you have the wrong ideas, which is likely with the wrong symbolic, then you will not have the right eyes. Now, ultimately, all of this is going to suggest that there are really relations, not really things. Then ultimately, scenes, what, what, re, the world is more so scenes uh, than it is things. It's more like paintings, it's more like art, it's more like an experience. Um, and it, it exactly is, and it's very unfolding, and we could use capital B being here, right? And the language we brought up with Trey was that the world is gifting itself to us as things, precisely because things are necessary for scenes. But the moment we reduce things, scenes to things, we lose the B. Therefore, we've entered a world that is not what it is. Iago, I am not what I am, kind of like Othello there. And it becomes auto-cannibalistic, and it self-effaces and eats itself. And that's unfortunately what we've done. We've generally gone around treating the world as a place of things as opposed to relations. There's a language of communal ontology that Mr. Florensky likes to talk about. You can use that language to go in a Trinitarian, um, that, that religious direction. Um, there are many thinkers of the modern counter-enlightenment that really want to stress that we live in a world of scenes more so than things. And art screams that it is a scene, not just a thing, because it's not just a painting. It points, it points, it points in the same way that words on a page when you read a book are not just the words on the page. They're pointing to something beyond themselves. A points to B. Um, and you see, if you take what, there's really a funny way 
We've talked a lot in Belonging Again about the collapse of Gibbons, the collapse of um, the spread of philosophical consciousness with David Hume, Peter Berger, and all these different people. And basically what's happening is when you are, when you are forced to realize that things cannot ground themselves, right? That you can't reach the thing of itself if we reference Kant or the absolute knowing where there's limits to knowledge that are the very constitution of knowledge, absolute skepticism in Hume where things cannot ground themselves. You have a choice there. Like it's almost like now history has brought us to the point where we are forced to choose either nihilism or, or to choose that things are actually um, idols and that reality is actually scenes. The world is scenes, ergo AB. But we seem to be stuck making that move precisely because of our symbolic. Our symbolic is Roman numerals holding us back. And so if we transcend the symbolic, this might open us up. If we get rid of the equal sign, this might open us up. Um, and so what's, and basically what's happening is almost like the force function. Um, the, the spread of philosophical consciousness, collapse of sociological givens, is having a force function to make us realize that something is wrong. And in making us realize something is wrong, we're now, everyone's now looking around, trying to figure out what it is. And it seems to have something to do with the equal sign. It seems to have something to do with A is A. Now, not just that, uh, but something with it. And you see the issue is, just like we said earlier, there would never be any reason to think there was something wrong with that until stuff go south. And again, the owl of Menevah flies at dusk, right? And so it seems like you almost require that forcing function in order to get there. I'm not, I don't know. Um, it, it seems like in Christianity, it can be God's grace, but then often that can reach you and change you without devastation. But then in Flannery O'Connor, grace often is devastation. So it's very hard to say. Anyway, um, what, what is occurring is you're kind of, f f in terms of sociology, the language I like to use is you have a collapse of givens. And if givens cannot be restored because that's like repairing a spider web with your bare hands using Wittgenstein, then there's only one other option. You have to move from givens to gifts, where the world is gifting itself as things. But it's not just, it's not actually things, because that would be idolatry. What it is, is um, what it is is scenes. It is a world of relations. It's a world of community, to use that communal ontology language. Heidegger, in that book he has, What is a Thing, he, he has this part where he talks about how uh, what we have to do is we have to present a question, we have to ask questions that are setting into motion the original inner happenings of this question according to its simplest characteristic moves, which have been arrested into a qu quiet sense. This happening does not lie somewhere aloof from us in the dim and distant past, but is here every proposition, in every in each everyday opinion, in every approach to things. So there's something in our very experience of all things that keep things as the way we experience them that just make them everyday and common. And that gets into all of the quote unquote existential concerns, chit chat, every day and so on and so forth. What he's saying is that to really ask a question is to make something that is in, quote unquote invisible to us like a working doorknob seen again before it is broke. And I think that's a good example because when do you see a doorknob? You tend to see it when it's broke, right? Then you look at it. Could you look at a doorknob before it breaks? Yes, but that seems to be very difficult. We tend to do it if it's a really beautiful doorknob or it stands out. But then, of course, that goes back to the theological issue of it's either devastation or beauty that brings about grace. So how do we make things invisible stand out? Because once they stand out, we can ask new questions about them. What can make the symbolic of A as A stand out as incomplete? Well, it tends to be when it breaks, right? Well, it's breaking today. That's the meaning crisis. That's the nihilism. Okay, it's standing out. So what's wrong? Is it, is it that we need to do A as A harder or that we're using a problematic symbolic? For Hegel, we're using a problematic symbolic. Um, and the very fact that we're even asking questions about the symbolic is a, is a function of the for, is a result of the force function of the sociological condition. And so forced, we can now engage in a clearing of our previous symbolics, A is A, so that being may sign forth anew, A, B. Also, as we come to the close here, we can talk about James K, F, C, U, R, what you love. And the idea is what you love is what you t turn to form your habits around. You tend to become like. And in that, if we can love AB, we can then be attracted to it, form our habits according to AB. But that's, this is where art, religion, and, and seemingly philosophy are so important because they can actually train us to love and enjoy thinking in terms of AB. Uh, and so we can then create habits of doing so. And basically, I don't think you can negate something like the equal sign or A is A unless you form habits around it. Because until then, it's just something you think. AB is just a notion. It's not something that's been mediated into the concept. And so you're not going to live it. You, you don't feel it, really. It's just, a neat, it's just like, oh, cool. We've deconstructed Aristotle. We've negated, sublated Aristotle. But for it to change your life, you have to love it. And this is where I think we see, again, art, philosophy, and religion have some sort of something special to them because they can train us. Um, 
But ultimately what we see in art is when we experience art is something that just fights. It just fights the tendency of us to reduce it to a material thing. It just won't let us do it. It fights it. So does religion. We try to just reduce it to a sociological phenomenon and it, and it, and it won't. It seems to have something to do with spirit. It just won't die. Likewise, philosophy, just when you think it's dead, is neo-pragmatism and deconstruction, it comes roaring back. The revenge of philosophy, as Cadell Das puts it. So these three, just when you think they're done for, roar back. They, they won't go away. And that right there suggests grace in the Flannery O'Connor section. Just when something is dead, it comes roaring back. It won't go away because in a Christian sense, God will not give up. And so these three have not given up on us. They have refused to let us reduce them to A as A. And as a result, there's the possibility when the forcing function of the sociological um, situation makes us ask questions about it, there is the possibility that we remember art, philosophy, and religion as not fitting into A as A and thus having reason to think that maybe A as A isn't the case. Thus, we can poke on it, like Derrida on the footnotes, and now the, we can open up from our enclosure to AB. We can enter that onto epistemology. And so we should be grateful that art, religion, and philosophy has not, quote-unquote, given up on us. Um, I think also to close, there's that wonderful book, uh, For the Love of Beauty, and he makes this point that Genesis 131 is often translated where it says, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And he wants to argue that the Jewish, um, the Hebrew word, uh, toba, um, T-O-W-B, actually is good and beautiful as well. So really we should translate it, that, um, that we live in a world, and so God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very beautiful. Because of A is A, we've really struggled to live in a world where the three infinites make any sense at all. Because the good is good, A is A, the beautiful is beautiful, and the true is the true. But really, what the three infinites suggest is that the good, true, and beautiful are all different sides of the same coin, and you need all three or you get none of them. Well, in a world where we've overcome the equal sign, if you will, then we can start to see how it's possible for three things that are different to also actually be the same. A trinity, if you will. Three persons, one essence. The trinity has never made sense because we've tried to think about it from the wrong symbolic, from A is A. But a world in which we've overcome and negated sublated A is A, into AB, where we've negated sublaying being into becoming, but also autonomous becoming into becoming with the B in parentheses, where we've negated the categories of incomplete and incomplete into incomplete with the I in parentheses, then it becomes possible for us to think that the good and the beautiful and the true are all dealing with the same essence. And that essence is one that we are invited to participate in, because we live in a world not of things, but of saints. And we are part of that very scene in its very dance if we choose to see ourselves as part of it because nature and notion inform one another. For more by OG Rose, please see ogrose.com, Twitter, Anchor, Instagram, Twitter, and so forth. And thank you so much for your time.